Okay, uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, front-end development with PureScript and Thermite. Uh, Thermite's this library um, that I wrote a while ago and I've been working on um, in different versions for a while now uh, for user interface development with React uh, in PureScript. Um, so it's built on top of the PureScript React library. Um, I only have about 20 slides, so uh, you know, please do stop me anywhere and ask questions or if, if a, an example would help, um, I can try and, you know, give an example in, in real code. Um, yeah, so uh, let's let's start. So the, the presentation actually itself is uh, is written in Thermite, just to give a, an example of the sort of things you can build. This is obviously a very simple app. Um, but at the end, if there's time, I'll, I'll try and go over the source code for the, for the presentation itself. Okay, so uh, just a quick introduction to uh, Thermite, the library. Um, it is uh, based on React, as I already said. So uh, in particular, it's based on the PureScript React library, which is uh, sort of bare bones uh, set of bindings using the FFI to, uh, to the, the React library. So typically you'd pull in React by a, either NPM or Bower or some other, um, uh, so, you know, whatever way you wanted to pull in React and include it on your page with a script tag, um, and then build your Thermite code using pulp, uh, include that with a script tag, uh, and then everything should just uh, be wired up. Um, and, and work correctly. Um, so I, I've said it, you know, it's opinionated. Uh, you know, we like to use this uh, phrase, you know, this word quite a lot when we're talking about UI libraries and, and libraries in general, whether or not uh, it allows you to sort of build your own framework or not. And Thermite, I don't think really um, allows you to sort of build your own framework uh, that much. It's, it's sort of, a, it's, a, it's a toolkit, but it's, uh, as you'll see, there are a couple of ideas that it sort of bakes in uh, on top of React. Um, to try and sort of like uh, uh, give a particular way of building UIs. Um, and the, the particular approach is inspired by a few libraries. So uh, in particular, it's inspired by Elm and the Elm architecture in a certain way. So if you're familiar with Elm, you'll have seen how you have, um, you know, a global state atom. And then, um, you know, we talk about having actions that act on the state. Uh, and we have the same thing in Thermite. And then we have components and we want to sort of glue them together uh, in such a way that the state and the actions also get wired around and, and put in the right place. Um, so we have uh, some, so Thermite is basically all about managing that state in a nice way uh, and the composition in a nice way. Um, uh, so the next library it's inspired by is this library from uh, Haskell and GHCJS called React Blaze, um, which is another React binding um, using uh, the Blaze HTML Haskell library. Um, but in particular, one thing uh, that I thought it did really well was it had a combinator for uh, stitching together components using lenses uh, that would allow you to uh, wire up um, actions uh, and states, you know, all in the right way automatically using, uh, using lenses and prisms and this kind of stuff. Um, and the same idea was applied in uh, Optic UI slightly differently and, uh, you know, with, you know it was the idea was developed a bit more in Optic UI. Uh, I'm not actually sure if Optic UI took the idea from React Blaze or not. Uh, it's sort of a natural idea, I guess, uh, once you think about the problem for a while. But uh, both of these libraries have this idea of composing components using uh, lenses and prisms. Uh, and finally, you know, it's quite stable. Uh, it, I bumped it up to version 1.0 recently. We, you know, it went through a lot of uh, quite rocky changes uh, for a while. Um, but now I'm fairly happy with the API. Uh, and I think you can use it confidently without uh, you know, too much concern of the API breaking. Um, okay, so as I say, just just uh, stop me if you have questions. I haven't given, I haven't looked at this presentation on this laptop before, so let me make sure I get the size right. Okay, um, so I just want to talk quickly about some problems for UI libraries uh, that, that any UI library, I think, any practical UI library has to solve. Um, and I think the, the, the main uh, UI libraries that we have in PureScript all solve these, but all in sort of slightly different ways. Um, so the three problems that I, I identified are, you need to be able to talk about multi multiple components in you know, a sensible way and have uh, things like state and actions wired to the right place when you have multiple components um, without too much boilerplate. Um, you need to have uh, the ability to talk to third party components and integrate with third party components nicely. Um, and it shouldn't, you know, ideally third party components should behave just like regular components uh, in some way. Um, so they shouldn't be particularly special. Um, and then you should be able to deal with asynchronous code. So for example, when a user clicks on a button, we should be able to go to um, a web service using Ajax um, and wait for the response and then 
when the response comes back, um, you know, modify the state of the, the component, this kind of thing. Um, so having good solutions for these three, three problems, I think is quite important. And, and as I say, the different libraries deal with these problems in different ways. So uh, to pick an example, because I think it has an interesting solution to all of these, uh, just to quickly talk about something like halogen, because it's a nice contrast. So uh, halogen has support for multiple components because uh, you know its its component model is is built in. Uh, its built-in component model has uh, support for um, slots for different components and this kind of thing. Um, Third-party components are supported because uh, it uses this sort of free monad approach where you can sort of define query languages for talking, where you can define a query language for uh, the action supported by a third com party component um, and talk about it abstractly and then have it also wire up at the end. Um, so everything looks uh, relatively uniform. Um, and it has uh, asynchronous uh, action support. Uh, I think uh, I think it started using coroutines actually in a relatively recent version um, as well. So compared to halogen, you know, Thermite has uh, slightly different uh, solutions to these problems, and I'm going to go through uh, how each of these gets solved. So, uh, in particular, uh, Thermite uses a couple of fairly advanced features from the PureScript libraries uh, to solve these problems. So, uh, the two features, or the two libraries, are lenses uh, and coroutines. Uh, so, I'm going to describe how each of these gets used. Does anyone have any questions so far? So let's, let's talk about components. So um, thermite components are essentially just uh, React components for a start. Um, so React components are defined by a state type, and then uh, they also define a render function, which takes a state and gives a, a virtual model of the view, which can be uh, you know, patched onto the, the actual DOM. Um, the, uh, so thermite takes that idea, um, but so you know, React components have a lot more. Uh, the, it's a very simplified model of React components, right? But uh, we're going to take that uh, simplified model and build on top of it. So we have a state type and a render function. In addition, thermite components have uh, an action type. Um, so the, sig the type signatures got a little bit long on the following slides, so I uh, shortened them by using these uh, Greek characters. So for the state type, I'm going to use sigmas. Um, for the action types, I'm going to use deltas. Uh, so we can think of an action as a change in a state. So we, you know, I want to write it with a delta. Um, so just like the Elm architecture, we have uh, an action type in addition to the state type. Uh, we have a rendering function, and we also have uh, an update function, which takes an action and the current state and gives back a new state. So in Redux, I think this is called the reducer or something like that. Uh, I think the reducer idea in Redux is, is very similar. Um, but yeah, the idea is that we have states and actions and actions uh, act on states. And actions come from things like uh, clicks on buttons uh, and user interactions uh, and, and update the state. And then we see changes in the UI. Okay, let's shrink that down a little bit. Okay, um, so this is, uh, this is the component definition from Thermite on one slide. And it's a little bit dense, because like I said, I sort of use Greek characters for everything to sort of compactify it a little bit, but I'll go through this. So. Um, if you want to build a thermite component, you have to give a specification for a component, uh, and that's one of these spec types. Um, so there is a function to take a spec uh, and turn it into a React class, so a, a React component class, and then you can sort of uh, render that in as part of your uh, React application. Um, so a spec is parameterized by uh, the things I just mentioned on the previous slide. So it has a state type, which is sigma, it has an action type, which is delta, um, and it also has a row uh, of effects to talk about the, the effects in addition to the DOM effects that we're interested in uh, performing in our components. So that might be things like uh, something to track these of like Ajax or a WebSocket or local storage, something like that. Um, and it def uh, defines two functions in addition to the, those two types. So as uh, a rendering function, so it takes uh, a state sigma. Um, I'll go through this type signature in a second, but that's going to take this, uh, this state sigma and give back um, a representation of the DOM, um, and it has a perform action function. And again, that's parameterized over these different types, and I'll go over that in a second. Um, so then let's look at the render function. Um, so the render function, again, is parameterized over the state and action types, um, and it takes a state, so this argument, we'll ignore the first one for a second, 
It takes a state uh, and it takes an array of React elements. So we can think of React elements as uh, a virtual representation of something that we might want to appear on the DOM. Um, we can think of this input array as uh, the child elements of the, uh, the element that we want to render on the screen. Um, and then it's going to give back an array of React elements. So this is uh, the rendered version of the, the component at this particular state. Okay. Um, but in addition, we also have this function passed in as an argument, which, is, which takes um, an action, so a change in the state, um, and gives back an event handler. So this can be used if you want to, for example, wire up um, an event handler to a button. Um, you could, uh, if you could uh, build uh, an event handler, which is something that can be passed into React uh, from an action that you would perform uh, when you clicked on the button. So I'll, I'll show that when, uh, when I show an example of a render function, a couple of slides. Um, but hopefully when we get to that slide, you'll have probably seen lots of things like this before, with, you know, from either things like, you know, JSX or Elm or uh, Pux, these kinds of things. Um, and then the final function type is uh, perform actions. So again, parameterized over the states and action types. Um, and that takes a, a state and it takes an action. And it, we said that actions act on states. So you might expect to see just another sigma here, but uh, because of the way uh, Ajax and asynchronous code in general work in Thermite, we have a, a slightly different uh, model, this sort of relatively complex type here. But um, you can think of this essentially as an asynchronous you know, machine that uh, emits state changes. So we, we, take a, we take the current state and we take an action that we want to act on the state and we go and do some asynchronous work. Um, and that asynchronous work can involve uh, you know, partial state updates. It's going to essentially emit uh, a set of state update functions as it goes. So this might be, this might sort of kick off a connection to a web socket or something like that um, and emit state updates as it gets updates from the server. Um, so I've got some more slides on this towards the end and we can go over that. But uh, essentially you can think of this, like I say, uh, conceptually as something that takes a state and an action and then yields a collection of state updates. Okay, uh, any questions on that so far? Hopefully this will become a bit clearer when I give examples, but yeah, any questions? What's the maybe state type for? Right, so uh, actually I'll, I'll explain this um, okay. on the other slide, but uh, Briefly, we want to think of React as like a, um, a machine that takes state updates and yields new states. So we need another machine to sort of uh, run in lockstep with that machine. And that's going to take new states and yield state updates. So as one yields, the other one awaits that yield and, and you know, they sort of uh, feed each other and make progress. Um, I have a slide about core routines later on that's gonna talk about this stuff. but. Um, Essentially, if you want to know what React did with your state update function, then you can use this to sort of case on, on that result. It's, it's a relatively uncommon case, but it comes out of the types and it turns out to be quite useful in some weird cases. So, yeah. Any other questions? I think I have a question on the previous slide and maybe this slide also. Okay. Um, so my experience with React and, and Redux has been, um, well, I guess I'm more curious how this is gonna pan out really because Looking at this now after using React and Redux a little bit, my understanding has been reducers and actions aren't this one-to-one -one mapping. You can have multiple actions handled by a single reducer. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like, essentially, that is, thinking of that as Redux, that is completely decoupled from components. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this seems to kind of uh, put all that stuff together. So... so um... It depends actually on uh, the way in which you combine your components. So it, it's definitely not the exact, it's not the same as Redux exactly, but um, it's quite close. And the, the difference is, uh, I think, that Thermite handles, uh, so right, the writing is implicit in the combination of components. So you can have cases where uh, you combine two components and an action is thrown in one, um, but it's actually handled by a reducer, if you like, in the other one, uh, mm -hmm. and the state in the other one will change. Um, and that's all sort of relatively lo loosely coupled, and uh, it's up to you how to uh, sort of, how to manage the, uh, make, make sure every, every action is handled, if you like, and handled in the right place. So compared to Halogen, for example, where everything is relatively explicit, and uh, if you're familiar, you know, it uses co-products uh, everywhere, and, and that can seem quite verbose, at, First, but the benefit is that um, the types guarantee that every action is handled somewhere 
I think. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that in Thermite. It's sort of uh, the onus is on the developer to make sure that every action is handled in the right place, but it means that it's relatively easy to do the sort of loose coupling approach where things can be handled in different places. Um, so I might have an example of that uh, when I get onto, I have a sort of like uh, to do MVC type example um, that I can show. And there's a nice example of that uh, writing of events. So hopefully when I get to that, I'll, I'll be able to answer your question properly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I, was, so I was just going to say as well, part of React, uh, the big thing has been that render is pure. Mm -hmm. When I saw event handler here, I thought like, is that somehow different? But I'm, I guess we, you can do the same thing in React. You pass event handlers, and they just get right bound in. Yeah, it's it's, it's a little tricky uh, trying to make sure that. Um, yeah, I mean, th this function is definitely pure, right? But uh, getting the types right for the event handler piece was was a little bit tricky, and I'm not sure I'm 100 percent satisfied with it yet. It's definitely it, it definitely does the job, but uh, yeah, it could probably be improved a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that yet, but we'll see. Uh, okay. Anyway, pressing on. So, um, so the simplest components you can build are just built out of, uh, these four pieces, right? These two types, state and action, uh, a render function, which renders a state and the perform action function, which, uh, updates a state based on, um, based on an action. Uh, so there's this function simple spec, uh, which just takes those two functions, render and perform action and build the spec out of it. And as I say, then you can just pass that off. Uh, to this func function called create class, uh, which just directly turns that into a uh, React class that you can build into a React application. Um, so that that answers first of all the uh, the third party components question, right? Because we're built on top of React. So uh, if you want to interact with third party components, then all you have to do is uh, build your Thermite components into React classes and then compose them in the same way you would um, compose regular React components. So that might mean that if you want sort of into a component communication, then you might have to come up with some sort of external mechanism for doing that. Um, but it's definitely possible with a bit of work to uh, interact with any third party React components that you might just, uh, you know, uh, find online, right? Um, so uh, let's give a quick example. So uh, suppose I want to build a counter uh, and it's gonna end up looking like this, where I, you know, I can click on the counter uh, and it just increments the, the label. Uh, so that might look like this. So I need to define those those four pieces, right? I need to define a state type, uh, and the state for this component is just an integer. So I just use a type alias. Um, I need to define an action type, and there's only one action, and that's the action when I click on the button. Uh, that's increment. Um, <clears throat> and then I can call simple spec to define the other two pieces. So I need a render function. Uh, that's here. So render took uh, a few arguments. It took uh, the, but notably it took uh, the function that took an action and could dispatch it by giving me back, giving me back an event handler. Um, and it took the current state, which in our case is, is just the integer count, right? Um, and I had to take a list of uh, child elements. Well, I don't need to parameterize over any child elements for a, count, uh, for a counter example, um, but I do have to give back a list of uh, uh, elements I want to render. So I just want to render a single button element so I can create that with the button constructor. Um, and, and then these, you know, these these functions I'm applying here all just come out of the PureScript React, React library. So I'm not going to uh, go over those in too much detail, except to just point out that the event handler is uh, constructed from this dispatch function by uh, providing this action. Okay. So uh, on click, on a click event, I want to dispatch this increment action um, to React to update the state, uh, or rather to Thermite to update the state to pass into React. Okay. Uh, and then the final of the four pieces I need to define is this perform action function. So uh, that takes the action that I want to perform and a couple of other things, uh, which I sort of took out of the previous slide because it was mostly just uh, details that we don't need for this presentation. But uh, the important thing is the action uh, and it's going to give me back one of these co-transformer things. So uh, co-transformer is a monad. Uh, so you can use do notation to stitch these things together. Um, it's also an instance of things like uh, monad af and, and all these things. Uh, so we can uh, lift up asynchronous actions, but for the purposes of this example, all I need is to uh, basically uh, perform a single transition on my state, which is to increment the state by one. Okay, so I, I, uh, I can form this function, which is you know uh, a section of the, the plus operator, and I just pass it to co-transform. So um, 
the names, you know, the, there are probably some sort of, uh, I could alias these things and it might be a bit easier, right? This, uh, this sh should probably be called, uh, you know, update states or something. But um, the, the basic idea is that this, this monad that I have to, you know, use on the right here has uh, one primitive thing, which is called co-transform. And it takes the uh, state transition function you want to apply and it gives you back the state uh, gives you back the state that uh, React actually uh, transitioned into. Um, well, I'm not actually interested in that in that case, so I just use void to uh, to get rid of the return type. Okay, um, but you could stitch these things together. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, wait a second and then update the state, and then wait another second and um, update the state again. Then you could do that by using do notation and interleaving these co-transforms with, uh, you know, AF computations to introduce delays or these kinds of things. Um, so you've got this nice language for composing these asynchronous state updates. Okay. Um, so any questions on that slide? The counter. Does this all make sense? Okay. Um, so the, the first of the three problems I mentioned was composing components, right? We need to be able to support multiple components and we need to be able to stitch them together in convenient ways in, you know, such that the state um, and action types all wire up nicely, okay? Um, so when we think about composition, we think about things like monoids um, and components do form a monoid. Um, and that gives you a, you know, a type of composition uh, that does some sort of wiring uh, for states and actions, but it's probably not the one you're thinking of, right? So if, if I put two counters next to each other like this using a monoidal append, um, the problem is now both of them update at the same time, right? They both share the same state. And this sort of should make sense if you think about the types, right? So a monoid has to take two things of the same type and it gives back something of the same type, but the type of the counter here bakes in the state type, right? So that means that both of these have to share the same state type, which means that they both have the, the combined component has uh, a state type of a single integer, right? So there's no way, there's not enough sort of space to pack in the data, the two, co two counters here, right? So we need some uh, different way of composing components. Um, or another way of looking at this is, I need a way of modifying a counter so that uh, I can embed its state, I, I can essentially break up the state of a bigger component into pieces and let each of the subcomponents work on pieces of the bigger state. Okay, so we start thinking about things like uh, curse, uh, curses in libraries like Ohm from Clojure, right? Um, we want a way of digging into uh, small parts of the state, uh, working on those with one component, and then you know lifting it back up when we have an action, so that can sort of wire up the changes uh, from an act that an action gives to, to the entire uh, large state atom, right? Um, so the way we solve that in, uh, in thermite is uh, using is using lenses and this idea called focusing. Okay, um, so I mentioned uh, oh, this idea called uh, cursors from Ohm, um, and the closest thing uh, in PureScript and Haskell and these sorts of languages is uh, is something like a lens. So we'll see how uh, you know that idea comes into play. Um, so the idea is that if I have two independent counters, I said that an integer was not enough to keep state for both of them, right? But the, the ideal state would be something like a tuple of two integers, one for the left-hand counter and one for the right-hand counter. Okay. Um, and if I think about the action type for a pair of counters, it would be something like the sum of two uh, counter actions, right? So remember, a counter action was just that singleton action that had an increment. Well, now, if I have a button somewhere on my page and I want to modify the state of two tuples, then I can either modify the left-hand counter or I can modify the right-hand counter. So I should be able to pick one or the other action, right? So I end up tupling up my uh, states, but I end up uh, summing up my uh, action types, okay? Uh, and it's perfectly possible to uh, wire up all of the actions and states by hand and, uh, you know, write combinators uh, such that when you perform an action, it goes to the correct state type and updates the right state type and it all, you know, gets plumbed around correctly. and, and uh, this is something that I think is done, for example, in Elm, the Elm architecture is encouraged. Um, but we can do better, I think, right? Using things like lenses and prisms, we can actually abstract over this idea of picking out a small part of the component state, 
or picking out a constructor deep inside an action, um, casing on that and updating the state in the right place. And then any actions that come from that small state update get wired up to the, the big state atom in the right way. Okay. Um, so we do that using lenses and prisms here. Uh, so I don't want to really give a full uh, overview of lenses and prisms here. Um, it, does anyone, has anyone, uh, sort of, has anyone never seen uh, the ideas of lenses and prisms before? Because I can probably give uh, a quick overview if need be. But uh, really, I, we don't need uh, we don't need uh, you know a full we don't need to fully go through lenses and prisms here. The idea is that a lens should um, allow us to pick out uh, one small piece of state that uh, you know is inside a bigger piece of state that corresponds to a smaller component. Uh, and a prism should allow us to pick an action that is one of uh, one of the constructors of a sum of different types of actions for a bigger component. Does anyone have questions about that? I'll, I'll go over this more fully in a second. But just a general idea. Okay. Um, so let me show the type of this combinator called focus. Okay. So suppose we have two counters. Um, so each counter had a state type of integer and it had an action type of uh, counter action, which was just this singleton type. Okay. Um, and I said that I wanted to build a component where the state type was a tuple of integers and the uh, action type was either one of the uh, counter actions or the other counter action. Uh, sorry. Um, well, one way to do that would be uh, to focus the left hand component such that it only acts on the left hand piece of the state, i.e. the left hand element of the tuple. So the left hand element of the tuple will be the state for the left hand component and the right hand element of the state will be for the right hand counter. Okay? Um, and the actions that update the left hand counter will be the left hand part of the sum uh, and the same for the right hand side. Okay? So first of all, we just focus the, uh, we focus one copy of the counter. Okay, so we say I want to focus based on uh, its state being the, the left hand component of the tuple and its action constructors being the left hand uh, element of the sum. Okay, and then I focus the right hand side by saying I want to act on the second hand, uh, second element of the tuple uh, and use the actions from the second component of the, the sum. Okay, um, so now each of these two expressions. Uh, has the right type, right? So now the state, because we've focused, the state has, uh, the state has become a tuple and the um, action type has become a sum, the same over here. Uh, now, they, now that they have unifiable types, I can actually combine them together monoidally um, and I get the right thing. Okay. So these uh, can be incremented independently. Uh, so this is a nice model for when we have components that we want to evolve independently of each other. Um, they can't. They can't talk to each other or share any state. Right? Um, was there a question? No. Um, okay. But uh, so this is the focus combinator type. Okay, and it's, it's uh, type signature is a bit more general. So it takes uh, it takes the component that we want to focus, uh, i.e., a component that uses the small state type and the small action type, and it's going to build it into. Uh, a component that has a different bigger state type and a different bigger um, action type. And the way it does it is to take a lens in general for the state. So it identifies the big state, uh, sorry, it identifies the small state as appearing inside the big state. Um, and it, a prism which identifies all the actions for the smaller component as being somehow embeddable inside the, as, as you know, a component of a sum um, inside the action for the biggest component. And the nice thing is because lenses compose like functions and prisms compose like functions, you know, we can define, we can even derive um, all our lenses for our different state types and all the prisms for our different action types, uh, and then just compose them together and all the actions just get wired up, wired up to the right place for us. And, you know, everything's built in by these combinators. We don't have to uh, uh, do any wiring of actions and states by hand. Okay. Um, so uh, any questions on that, first of all? Or go on to the next piece. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I could now, if I swap, for example, the prisms, I could make the first counter actually handle the actions from the second one, right? Right. So if you, uh, so what you'd have to do if you wanted to do that. So let's say I wanted to click on this right button, and it would increment the left button. Um, well, we could do that, but we'd have to say we'd have to uh, 
we'd have to, for example, keep the focused on the left hand state, but uh, yeah, have uh, change this to a right or something like that. Okay, and use the second hand component of the state, but use the left hand constructors of the uh, actions, or vice versa. Right, you could think of it the other way. Uh, keep keep the actions the same and switch the states. Um, yeah, so you, you can do all these different types of wiring. Um, but the idea is that these components are independent, right? Uh, or at least, well, it, it, it depends on how you wire it, right? The, the default config, the, 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 the sort of, the basic idea here is, here is that we have two independent components um, and we want to uh, just glue them together in, you know, such, such that uh, they have this, this tuple of states. Um, so, so now we have sort of two different models for, for com, uh, combining things, right? We have, I want to place two components next to each other and they have the same state and, and these are very dependent components. Like here, they're as dependent as they could be, right? They, there's nothing tracked by one that isn't tracked by the other. Um, and here is uh, the, other, the other type, which is completely independent, right? Um, yeah, they can't communicate at all, but I could mix and match these together, right? I could start with very uh, fine-grained components um, and then build them up in such a way that sh you know, state was shared where it needed to be, um, and it wasn't shared and things were independent where, uh, where appropriate. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the sort of the plumbing is still left up to the, the developer, but, uh, all of the sort of complexity of wiring up the actions and states and that kind of stuff is, is hidden, right? We don't have to worry about that anymore. So it's another thing we, you know, we can't get wrong, which is nice. Okay. Uh, any other questions on that before I go on to this piece? Okay, so um, so if lenses let us talk about independent components, right? We want to break up our uh, state into a tuple of two states. Um, then what about if I want to use a prism for my uh, for my state type, right? Not for the action type, but if I want to use a prism to break up um, the uh, the state type into a sum. So what would what would it mean if we had a sum of a sum of two different state types? Well, um, that means I can either be in uh, state type one, and then I have a component that models state type one. Um, and, you know, it, it has its own actions that can act on the state, or I can be in state type two, and there's another component that uh, can work on the states in state type two with its own action type, right? So that's a little bit like tabs, okay? Um, I can be in tab A and I have a component for tab A, or I can be in tab B and have a component for tab B. Um, although it's a little more restrictive than tabs in, you know, full generality, right? Uh, so Again, this is just another model for combining components that comes out of the, the types. Um, so it's convenient in some cases, but uh, it does have some restrictions, right? So um, one restriction is that the action type, <coughs> pardon me, the action type delta here um, in the split combinator takes this prism that breaks something down into a sum. Um, the state type changes based on the prism. So this is going to be something like breaking it into two, two parts of a sum, but the action type always stays the same, right? So we can't have, uh, independent actions right now when we use the split combinator to come up with a tab-like component. Um, this might change. I think you know a future version of the API, API could actually uh, do something a little more useful with the state type, uh, the the action type here. But right now, if we're using this this split combinator for tab components, we have this restriction where um, actions always act on, uh, but you know uh, the actions have to be able to handle both of the tabs at the same time. Um, and because uh, we can, the state is either one state or the other state. Um, we can't share any information between tabs, right? So we can't, um, or rather, any information that we want to share between tabs has to sort of flow via actions, right? If we want to, um, if, we, if we're in tab A, we can respond to an action and update the state and go, and go into a state uh, that would take us into tab B on the other side of the sum, for example. Um, but we can't have information that's uh, sort of common to both tabs, if that makes sense, uh, purely inside the state type. So, so this is a little restrictive, but uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, way of combining components that's also available uh, based, on, based on the optic idea. Okay. Um, and then the, the third uh, type of composition that Thermite support is a bit more interesting, right? So uh, this is for when we want to support things like lists. Uh, or you know, lists of components, uh, each of which uses the same uh, component, but we have a list of states. Okay. Um, uh, and for this, uh, we have this com uh, combinator called for each. 
Okay, so um, if you're familiar with um, you know existing libraries like uh, I like I like uh, Knockout JS. I, I used that a while ago. Some libraries are a little bit out of date now, I suppose. But uh, um, the nice thing is that each of these uh, types of uh, composition corresponds to um, like built-in uh, markup that comes with um, libraries like Knockout JS. And I think you know Angular has similar things, and all these libraries have similar things. Um, but essentially, these combinators are like first-order versions of these things that are baked in as markup into these other. Uh, you know, JavaScript UI libraries, right? Um, so for each takes, um, the component that I want to uh, render for each list element, but it's parameterized over the index uh, in the list that it came from. Okay, so I have a function from list indices to uh, components. So, um, you know, nothing's stopping me here from rendering something very different for each list index. You know, the function could return completely different components if I wanted it to. Um, but in practice, uh, it's more common that this this component would be sort of fixed, and then the integer would just be used to sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, it would be used for things like actions or uh, to change uh, change the behavior of the component. Maybe I need to pass the integer as an index back to the server or something like this. Okay, so the idea is that we have some component um, with some state type and some action type uh, for each list element, and then I can turn that into a a component uh, that has a list of those states as its own state, um, and its action type uh, bakes in the action uh, for the subcomponent. Um, but in addition to saying I want to perform this action on the subcomponent, I need to be able to say which subcomponent in the list I want to act on. So I also have to provide uh, an integer as well. Okay. Um, so, so this is quite a convenient way if you want to build things like tables or uh, you know lists in general. Um, in Optic UI which uh, you know, inspired Thermite, as I said before. This is generalized to an index traversal. Uh, so it's a little more general. We can talk about things like um, components for uh, trees of states or pairs of states or maybe states or, or all, of, all of these different uh, container types, um, all in the same sort of uniform way by just uh, giving uh, an index traversal into the elements that I'm interested in rendering in my list. Um, so we don't do that in Thermite and that's something that might change um, you know, in a 2.0 release uh, for breaking API change. Um, but uh, I think the ability to deal with lists uh, is already quite powerful, right? So uh, that's not something I'm too worried about right now. Um, so I just said, note that we have a, a whole list of states, you know, the, the state type got enlarged uh, by the list constructor. So we have a, a state for each element of the list now. Um, and the action type now has to track the index of the component to update, okay? Uh, so any questions on any of that? This all making sense? Okay. So just to summarize the lens stuff uh, really quickly, um, there's four types of uh, composition that we have here uh, and different ways of handling them in Thermite. Uh, so if you have a pair of components and you want them to uh, share the same state, so the, the uh, they could be different uh, renderings of the same state, but uh, they they do share the, share the same state. Well, that's just uh, monoidal append. Uh, if you want a pair of components um, and they have independent states, or more generally, you just have a collection of components with independent states that you want to place next to each other, well, you can handle that with the focus uh, function. Um, and the corresponding optic there is, is lens. Okay. Um, if you want tab components with independent states for different tabs, um, the split combinator can handle that, and we have uh, the, the, the corresponding optic is prism. Okay, um, and if you want to deal with uh, data lists or lists of components, uh, some list of states, then the for each function you, uh, can handle that, and the corresponding optic is a traversal. Okay. Okay. Uh, so quickly, just uh, to show a demo of, of this sort of stuff. Um, so here's the uh, the to do list, the to do MVC. Uh, What's the dog? This demo. Uh, what the dog? I don't know. Uh, groceries. Okay. Um, and then it has all of the sort of typical MVC to do MVC type stuff. So I can say uh, this one's complete. And I only want to see active tasks, or I only want to see completed tasks. Um, and then I can delete tasks as well. Okay. Um, so this I think demonstrates um, a few of those different ideas. It doesn't have any tabs, but it has. Uh, Pretty much everything else. Uh, 
that I just mentioned related to the lenses stuff. Um, so I can show the code for this and hopefully things will um, fall into place a bit more. So um, we have different component types. We have a task component and we have a task list component. Uh, so task will probably be a nice demo of the, uh, you know, the, the simple components, stuff that I covered at the start. Okay, that is this readable? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that works. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right, so uh, we have to define a state type and a task, uh, an action type, okay? So um, a state for a task is just a record that has a Boolean for whether it's completed or not, um, and a description of the task that's editable by the user, okay? Um, an initial task function just takes a string that the user typed in and it con uh, constructs a task with the completed, set, uh, completed flag set to false, okay? Uh, and the action type, has two constructors. Okay, so we can change the com uh, completed flag by specifying the new completed flag. Okay, this could just be toggle actually, but here I just specify the, uh, the new, new value of the flag. Um, or I can remove a task. Okay, and that corresponds to the red button that was on the right. Okay, um, and I use simple spec to construct this. Okay, so there's no component composition going on here. This is just a single component, so I can build it using simple spec. Okay. Um, it has a render function and it has a perform action function, which I'll show first. Okay, uh, actually, this isn't necessary anymore. So ignore this line. This was for an old bug. I should have gone through this before I showed this. Um, but if we handle the change completed um, action here, then we run the code transform action, um, and we provide an update function that sets the completed flag to whatever the action said it should become. Okay, um, but notice that we don't handle the remove task action here okay the remove task action is something that modifies a list of um, tasks it takes the element out of the list um, so that's going to be handled by essentially a for each combinator in the parent component uh, so this is what i was talking about when i said that uh, uh paul you asked about the, the redux thing with the you know uh, things are relatively loosely coupled so we can choose to uh we can choose to handle things in the same place as the component is defined, or we can just defer them. So we can say this component does nothing with this action, and the action is going to be defined. Uh, the action is going to be handled elsewhere, like by the parent or, so, or some other handler. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so this is this is the simple the simple example, right? So here's the rendering function. There's nothing really special to say about this. Uh, you know, apart from to comment that uh, again, we just use the dispatch dispatch function. Um, to turn actions into React event handlers. Okay. Um, also, uh, here's, a, here's another example where um, I have to do something a little bit unpleasant using onto coerce to pull out uh, properties of the event object because Thermite and PureScript React don't define any uh, built-in functions for pulling out event properties right now. That's probably going to change relatively soon, but for now, uh, we can just use these sort of tricks to, to pull out the, the, uh, the values that we need. Uh, it's not ideal, but um, it will improve. So, so that's the simple version. And then uh, the task list component, there's a lot of code in the task list component because it does a few things, but um, it's actually a few different components, uh, but it should give an overview of a few different ideas. Okay. Um, so a task list is a component and it has an action type, okay? So there's four actions we can perform uh, on a task list independent of any um, particular uh, task. Okay, so we can create a new task with a description. We can edit an existing task. Sorry, we can edit the, uh, we can edit the text that corresponds to the task I want to create. So this is basically editing the text in the new task text box. We can set the filter at the top level. So the filter was those three buttons for I want to see everything or the active things or the completed things. Okay. Uh, so this is just changing that filter. Or finally, I can embed an action for um, a subcomponent. So one of the tasks that I have in my list. Okay, so I can act on task at index i um, with a task action. So I could either remove it or I could change its uh, change its text. Okay. Oh, sorry, change its completed flag. Okay. So um, because we need uh, we need, we need uh, prisms and, and lenses in a few places to sort of uh, do this wiring. These could actually be uh, defined by the PureScript derived lenses library. 
uh, but here I just wrote it out by hand, right? So I have a task action prism that corresponds to this constructor. So it identifies uh, a tuple of an integer and a task action as a, uh, one of the summands of my task list action type, right? So that's this constructor right here. Um, so notice this looks a lot like what I need to provide to the for each function. So this isn't by accident, right? This is gonna be convenient when it comes to uh, wiring up uh, my task component to the, to the for each function. Okay. Um, and then my state type for a task list has a list of tasks. So one, um, one task for every uh, list element. Um, it has the uh, text box state for the, the new task uh, text box. Uh, and it has a filter that's currently applied. Okay. Uh, so I think filter is defined in another module, but it's basically the thing you expect it to be with three constructors, one for each of the, the, the three filters in that little uh, tab component at the top. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have an initial state. Again, we have to define a few lenses. I want a lens for the, the list of tasks inside, um, inside the, uh, the, the full state. Um, and then the um, task list component definition looks like this. Okay. Um, so it's basically just a fold, which is going to use monoidal, uh, monoidal append to combine these, these different uh, components together. So it's defined in terms of uh, these smaller components uh, and wrapped in this container element. Okay, so as a header, um, the header defines the, uh, the filter bar and, and the, the header text and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it has a table component um, and there's a little bit of wiring here that needs to be done to sort of get the, uh, the components into the right place. But um, the thing that, uh, the, the sort of key thing here is to use the for each combinator, okay? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, to use the for each combinator to wrap up the task spec, okay? So um, you can sort of look through this and, and sort of check the types manually, but it all works out, right? I start out at the top level. I need to have uh, a, a task list, a task list state. Well, I can focus in on the task list by using that lens I had for the tasks. Uh, uh, you know, the tasks uh, record property, okay? Um, and I also focus in on the uh, task action constructor, which was that thing that pulled out that integer and in the task uh, action, okay? Um, and then because I have the right types that can apply to the for each combinator, now I can apply that. Um, and I've focused in essentially on one element of the list and I need to provide a, uh, I need to provide the, um, the specification for a component for a list element. Well, that's just a task spec. So the types all line up and there's a little bit of, uh, well, actually, there's quite a bit of uh, noise here because I need to sort of wrap up the elements, you know, actually in the DOM and um, make sure all the types line up. But uh, most of the wiring for actions has gone away, right? Um, can, can you, uh, can I just say one thing that I just noticed? Yeah. I found cool. Like when I think about the yeah, architecture or these things, I would think about having to pass the piece of state that I want the header function to care about, like to the header component. Mm -hmm. We the task, list. but here that's kind of like the wiring. The header just has access to the entire state because of the monoidal composition, right? Yeah, all all of the wiring sort of uh, gets hidden behind these combinators, right? So there's a lot of sort of wiring that's involved in this this fold function right here, right? For example. So here, every time we have one of these four subcomponents, that's going to wire the state down into the subcomponent. And every time we get an action from one of these subcomponents, it's going to push it back up so that it acts on the full state. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's 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 a lot of sort of power in like the type of class abstractions that we, we're using here, right? Like this is this is doing a lot of wiring for us. Uh, it's very uh, a lot of implicit wiring, but it's very powerful. Um, same thing with these, right? There's a lot of wiring going on inside for each and there's a lot going on inside focus. Um, so this is very compact representation, right? Admittedly, there's, there's still quite a lot of sort of, uh, you know, dumb stuff that needs to be written, but that'd have to be written anyway, right? Um, and there's perform action functions that have to be written. Every, every action has to be handled somewhere, but the high level composition of these components is very compact, right? Uh, which is nice. Um, Let's see, I wanna find a good example of a uh, perform action. So let's look how the actions get broken down here, right? So we have this header component. Um, header has the same uh, state type as the whole component because it's just combined with this monoidal append. Um, so it identify, it, it uses the whole state type and it uses the whole action type, um, but it only, 
So I think this is rendering the filters, by the way, this button group. Um, it only ha handles the uh, new task action, right? Um, other, um, other actions will actually be handled elsewhere for various reasons. Okay, so if you have a new task, then we respond to that by co-transforming, that was that combinator, uh, that uh, is going to emit these state update functions. Well, here's my state update function. Okay, it's just going to cons an initial task onto my list of states, uh, onto my list of tasks, sorry. Okay. Um, so what's missing? We have, uh, here's my table component. Um, I have a footer, no actions handled there. So I should point out, if you don't have any uh, actions that you, you want to handle in a component, you can just say default perform action. And that's just going to be like a pure rendered component with no, uh, no events. Okay. Um, and then similarly, if you don't want to render anything in a component, if you just want the component to only act as uh, handling um, actions, then you can use default render. And that says, I'm not rendering, I'm just, hand, I'm just going to provide a perform action function, okay? Um, well, all of the remaining actions are going to be handled here, okay? So I have um, a task action. Uh, if I want to uh, perform a, tax, a task action on uh, at element i, and I'm trying to remove a task, well, that was the, that was the action that wasn't handled um, inside the task component, right? In the task component, I handled the uh, change completed action. But I didn't handle remove task, and I said the reason was was because I needed to have access to the whole list of uh, tasks. Okay, well I can handle it here, um, and I can do that by using co-transform. I take the state and I just uh, delete the state at index i. Okay, um, then I can handle the set edit text. This one's a bit simpler. I just uh, co-transform with the function that sets the edit text to the string that I'm supposed to use. Uh, and the same for set filter, okay, just setting um, setting the filter property on the state uh, and everything else is ignored. But now you notice that everything is handled somewhere, um, but unlike halogen, we don't have this nice property where the type system guarantees that we handle everything. That's unfortunate, but uh, on, you know, for that we've traded the sort of the ease of uh, you know, com composition by using things like lenses, right? Um, so maybe there's a, an architecture that actually uh, Let's us have both benefits, right? I don't know yet. Maybe, uh, that's probably worth looking at, but I don't know the answer yet. Okay, uh, so that's to do MVC. Can I ask one more question? Yep. Um, can I ask, uh, sorry, can I handle an action in two different places? Or is it gone once I handle it? You, you can, uh, definitely. You just have to be a little careful, right? Because uh, these, uh, there's, there's race conditions that can creep in, right? Because um, co-transform is is a coroutine. It's hiding this sort of asynchronous behavior where you know I step, and at each step I have the option to update the state. Well, now I'm racing to state update function uh, producers, right? Um, I need to make sure that they don't sort of tread on each other's toes and, and update the same parts of the state because then you're going to erase work done by each one. So there's a little bit of care needed if you're going to do that sort of thing. Um, so it just, it just sort of like advanced use cases are supported, but uh, I haven't sort of optimized for them, right? And uh, but but yeah, they're possible. It's possible to to do that sort of thing with a little bit of working it, a little bit of care. Yeah, I thought of a component like say a slider or something, which needs access to a to a number value in your state somewhere, and it can update that value. Mm -hmm. You might want some other component uh, react to the change of value in the right. in the slider, basically. So then you could make that reusable, that slider component. Yeah, so the idea there would be, you know, I, I have my slider itself, right? And the slider responds to the event. And then, you know, it needs to modify its own state so that, you know, the slider dot value or whatever has the right value, okay? Um, but the other component isn't going to be modifying the slider. So that's okay, right? It, it's okay to have two components handling the same action as long as they act on different parts of the state, I think. And that's, that's the reason why we always emit uh, state update functions, right? Rather than emitting states. Because I can have state update functions that act on different parts of the state, but uh, if I compose them, but I can't, uh, if I have each action give back a whole fresh state, then the second one's gonna wipe out the work done by the first one, okay? So it, as I say, it's possible to handle these sort of cases. It just needs a little bit of care. Uh, any other questions on that stuff?
Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, I have to wrap up relatively soon, but I think I'm toward the end here. Okay, all right, so let's talk about core routines, right? Because that's the sort of missing piece here, uh, specifically this co transformer idea, because it's uh, still a little bit opaque, I think. Um, okay, so I'll give, a, I'll give a very quick overview of uh, core routines in PureScript. Um, so we have this library called PureScript Coroutines that's used by Thermite and Halogen now, um, and it defines this abstraction called Coroutine. Okay, um, and we can think of Coroutines as um, sort of uh, machines that can work over some base monad. Okay, and usually uh, in practice, this is going to be something like AF, where we can deal nicely with effects, but also have uh, asynchronous stuff going on at every step. Okay, and these machines are going to act. Uh, in steps, okay? So it's going to produce one monadic action and maybe produce some data or await some data or transform some data. Um, and then it's going to uh, suspend. Um, and then when it continues, when, when, the, when the coroutine is resumed, um, it will do the same thing again, right? It will have some monadic effects and then it will produce or consume some data, etc. So these give nice models for things like uh, data producers, data consumers, or data transformers, where we we have actions that are uh, proceeding in steps, and at every step we can have some act, we can have some uh, external actions modeled by some monad. As I say, it's probably going to be AF, um, but also interact uh, in some way by either producing data or consuming data or transforming it. Okay, so it generalizes all of these three things, um, and it's a good model for um, various processes that we have in the browser. So things like AJAX, right? So with AJAX. I might want to do something like um, produce some data and send it to a web server as the first chunk of my AJAX request and then uh, wait until I get, you know, suspend and wait until I get resumed, whatever that might mean, um, and then produce the next chunk of data and send it to the server and so on until I've run out of data to send, okay? Or I might be consuming data, so I might uh, kick off an AJAX request, um, wait for the first chunk of data to come from the server, um, and in response, perform some monadic action and then suspend until I get the next chunk of data from the server, okay? Um, or something like WebSockets or Node Streams are both uh, good examples of, uh, um, you know, abstract, uh, of uh, different things that can use this abstraction, okay? So Node Streams in particular could be producers or they could be consumers or they could be duplex streams, right? They could be data transformers. Something like uh, a node stream for uh, a node duplex stream for GZ, for example, would be modeled well by uh, a data transforming coroutine. Okay, so uh, so coroutines are also a nice model for uh, cooperative multitasking. Okay, because um, everything acts by doing a small amount of work and then suspending. So now I can write different schedulers for for very. If I have a whole pool of coroutines, then I can write different schedulers given different priorities for my core routines, right? So I could step the high priority ones and then uh, have them wait while I, you know, pick a low priority thing um, and a low priority core routine and, and step that by one step and then I go back to the high priority pool, things like this, right? Uh, um, so they provide this nice model for, uh, for, for multitasking as well. So that's another way to think of these core routines, okay? Um, and the other nice property of coroutines is that they can be combined in nice ways. Okay, so if I take something, if I, I take a coroutine for uh, producing data and a coroutine for consuming data, and they produce and consume the same type of data, then I can run them together in lockstep. Okay, so I can run the producer coroutine by one step, and that will perform its monadic actions, um, and it will yield some data that is produced. Okay, well, then I can feed that to the consumer coroutine and it will, in response, perform its own monadic actions um, and then stall, okay? Uh, then I go back to the producer and I run it by one more step, get some more monadic actions, a new input, feed it to the coroutine for the consumer, et cetera, right? So I can fuse these two things together in a nice way. So um, these are nice models for these things, as I mentioned, Ajax. You can imagine taking um, you know, an Ajax, uh, Produce a coroutine for something that's downloading data from a web uh, downloading data from an AJAX request, um, and then uh, fusing that with a consumer for a web socket, for example, or fusing into a node stream for gzipping, and then fusing the output of the node stream for gzipping into a consumer for AJAX that's pushing the data back up into another web service, and all of this is working in a streaming fashion, right? Because I have. Uh, Everything is working on chunks of data at a time and I'm feeding the data through this, this pipeline of coroutines. Um, 
uh, one chunk at a time. So that's, that's uh, you know, it's a nice abstraction for a lot of these uh, uh, types of things. And um, they have all these nice properties like, uh, like streaming and uh, composability. Okay, so uh, PureScript that I might use is this, uh, in particular it uses this co-transformer idea for its, um, uh, for its uh, state update functions, okay? Um, any questions on that before I, um, if it wasn't clear, it will probably become a little bit more clear on the next couple of slides, but any questions? I'm just generally curious under the hood, what's it doing? Is it kind of like what a ES6 generator uh, um, else to you or something? It, it's, it's entirely built in sort of, you know, user space as a library, right? So um, it's actually just a free monad transformer. Well, okay, so that needs some explanation, right? But uh, the, the, the free monad transformer is defined in the free T library, okay? Um, and the core routine library doesn't add anything. It's literally just a type alias, the free T. Okay, so the free monad, um, you know, Halogen uses the free monad quite a lot, right? It's a nice abstraction for when you have some uh, functor that defines all of these operations that you can do at each step. Um, and then you want to stitch them together in a, in a monad where at every step you can, um, uh, you can perform one of those actions and then you suspend and you, um, you wait till the next step and the next step you can do the same actions and you suspend. Okay. The free monad transformer is the exact same thing, except for that you have some base monad where in addition to doing that thing that's described by the functor, when you suspend, you also can perform actions in the base monad, right? So for, for something like at, at, that means that you can uh, delay or you can do, you know, you can perform actions that involve waiting in some sense. So things like Ajax. Okay. So this is a good model for those sorts of things. Um, so the F is going to track things like I'm producing values of type T or I'm consuming values of type T and M is going to track things like, you know, uh, everything else that I can perform in the base monad at every step. So, um, delays, app actions, uh, you know, whatever, Ajax, local storage, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the answer is if you understand free monads, it's, it's just the free monad transformer, right? It's the free monad over, you know, transformed over some, some base monad, which is going to turn out to be, to, to be AF. Um, and in particular, like free, uh, producers and consumers are, you, you get producers and consumers by um, fixing this F to be uh, something something appropriate, right? So for producers, I fix it to be this emit functor. Okay, so emit says, uh, I'm going to emit these values of type O. Every time I stall, my, every time my core routine gets suspended, I'm going to emit, I'm going to give you an O, which is the, the value I produced. Um, and I'm going to give an A. So A just models what to do next, right? So every stage I have, um, the O I produced and, and what to do next. Okay. For a consumer, I, I use this await constructor. Okay. So every time I suspend, I'm going to wait until you give me an I, which is the input for the consumer. And then I'm going to tell you what to do next. Okay. Um, so you can stitch these two things together and it turns out there's a nice sort of uh, description of how to stitch them in terms of the functors that define them. Um, and this is the sort of, this, this is the, the content of the PS script for routines library, right? It defines all of these nice, uh, combinators for stitching together the different types of functors. So it defines a stitching for emit and a weight, and it defines one for a weight and, you know, a transformer functor and all these types of things. Um, so it gives you a way of sort of stitching together these uh, coroutine, these descriptions of what these coroutines are going to do at every step. Um, and then when you turn them into coroutines using the free on a transformer, now, you know, they can be zipped together and, um, and combined in a nice way such that everything's, you know, this, this sort of nice streaming uh, approach where, you know, we handle one chunk at a time and push the chunk through all of these different core routines at once. Uh, does that answer your question? So I know it's a little bit around the houses, but does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Can I ask one question? Yep, sure. Um, I know that the, the pipes library in Haskell has also has this underlying proxy type, which yep. Which is like producers and consumers do have the same type under the hood. So, so that, the pipes library um, is slightly different, right? I think like conceptually you can think of it as a coroutine, but it's a coroutine that bakes in um, a few different operations. So it has, so pipes has um, downstream and upstream. Okay. And it has traffic flowing in both directions. So you can do lots of things. You can say, wait for information coming from downstream or push information upstream, or push information downstream, or wait for information coming from upstream, right? So really there's four things going on at the same time. Um, 
<clears throat> so I think conceptually it's a core routine, even if the implementation is like slightly different, but um, as I understand it, yeah, uh, they, they compose. So you get the, these nice types of composition in the pipes library, you know, for the same reasons that we get the nice compositions of core routines. It's just specialized to a particular, um, uh, uh, it's specialized to a particular functor that defines all these different interactions with upstream and downstream. Um, so I'm just going to get a drink, just one second. Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions on that? Okay, so that's producers and consumers. Uh, the other type of core routine that we're interested in is, interested in is uh, transformers, okay, and co-transformers particularly because that's the one that we use in, uh, in Thermite. Okay, uh, so if a producer was something that uh, produced an output at every suspension of the core routine, and a consumer was something that waited at every suspension, um, then a transformer is something that does a little bit of both, right? So it waits uh, for an input, and then it uh, transforms that input into an output and provides that output when it suspends. Okay, so you can think of, like I mentioned something like GZ uh, inside Node, this like duplex stream from Node, okay? We could think of that as a waiting, so that the type I here would be like some byte string chunk or you know, some encoded bytes or something. Um, and O also would be you know, decoded bytes or something like this, right? So it, it awaits um, a chunk, and when it, when it gets a chunk, it uh, produces the corresponding decoded or un uh output chunk um, and continues, right? Or rather, it suspends at that point and waits for more data. Okay. So we want something, um, essentially what we're going to have in, uh, in Thermite is that we want to think of React as like a transformer, okay? Um, and we want to fuse it with uh, something that uh, is defined by our components um, that can sort of drive, like provide the inputs that it needs and respond to the outputs that it generates, okay? Well, the thing that fuses with a transformer, just like a producer fused with a, a consumer, um, a transformer fuses with a co-transformer, okay? So whereas a transformer waits for input and then produces output, the co-transformer produces output, sorry, here, produces output first and then waits for more input and then suspends, okay? So our component is going to say, um, every uh, every step um, after I click my button, um, at every stage of my core routine, I'm going to produce a state update function, and I'm going to then wait for React asynchronously to say, "Okay, now here is the next state that's been set on the component." Okay, and this is actually asynchronous, which was something I learned only recently. Um, if you uh, if you try to do a synchronous state update in React, sometimes you can run into sort of strange race conditions. And there's an issue for this that I think is now closed on, on the Thermite uh, issue list. Actually, that was the code that I had earlier that wasn't removed, that should have been removed. Um, so the solution is that React provides a function called something like write state with callback, okay? Um, and it's actually an asynchronous function. When React is fully finished, asynchronously updating its internal state, then it will, it will call your callback, okay? So that's why, our underlying monad here is going to be ah, but the model of uh, you know the state and state transitions is a code transformer. Okay, so we we emit an O, which in our case will be a state update function, and then we wait for React to say, okay, I'm good. Here's the new state. Okay, um, and in in practice, we probably won't use the new state all that much, but it, it turns out to be useful for some you know more advanced use cases. Um, and then the sort of primitive inside this co-transformer monad, as I said before, is uh, this co-transform function. Okay, so co-transform says, um, if you give me an O that you want to emit, then I'll emit that uh, in the co-transformer monad. Um, and I'll give you back, the, the return value of this monadic computation is going to be the I that comes back from the co-transform when it's finished transforming, okay? Um, so obviously this is the function that we use. Uh, to drive the state updates inside our perform action functions. Okay, um, any questions on that? Okay, uh, so I pretty much already described what's on this slide. Um, we can think of React as a transformer. Okay, so React, um, actually it's a co-transformer and it's a little bit more, uh, 
it took a bit more sort of work to figure out how to exactly fuse these in the right way. But uh, we can think of React as some kind of transformer that's uh, going to take state update functions um, and emit um, uh, new states. There's actually a maybe here in practice in the implementation because when we have things like uh, for each, like the for each, you know, this thing that created the data list of components, um, we have to handle the case where I tried to update the state, but uh, I have a race condition which results in the elements of the list I wanted to update being missing from the state by the time I got there to update it. Okay, so like somebody deleted the element before I was able to update it. Okay, so in that case, I have to say, sorry, uh, I couldn't update the state function because it was missing. Uh, I couldn't update the state because it was missing. Uh, and we have a nothing to track that. Okay, uh, so we can think of React as this co transformer, and then we have a co transformer defined by the perform action function, and we just stitch these two together in lockstep. So every time um, every time I, my co-transformer from my component produces a state update, I feed that into the React co-transformer and I wait for it to give me the new state and I continue the, uh, you know, so I have this feedback loop where I feed this back into my update core routine. Um, again, it produces a state update function or completes, et cetera. Okay. So all of the sort of, uh, all of the functors disappear here and we just end up with this list of actions that I can just run asynchronously. Okay. Um, okay, so that's about all I had. I just wanted to point out that uh, there's a website called Trithermite, uh, which is like TriPureScript. Um, you can just, uh, let me unbiggen this a little bit. You can uh, you know, type your Thermite uh, component code into the left-hand side and it will render it on the right-hand side. Okay, so there's a few lessons that go through the, the stuff that I already talked about. Um, so here's a simple render-only component. Um, this one doesn't have any, uh, you know, it has this default perform action here. So it doesn't have any uh, actions. It just displays the state. Uh, lesson two goes through, uh, if you have actions, um, now I have this perform action function, which uses call transform. So we have increment and, and decrement here. So we're gonna increase the state and decrease. Um, lesson three goes through async. So now it waits a second and then it updates the state. Okay, so now here it's just using lift at or lift to perform a delay before it does the code transform. Um, lesson four goes over components. So this was the case where we had, uh, let's see, where is it? Um, so I have a tuple of states, right? One for each of the components. Um, and somewhere in here, yeah, okay, I'm using focus to focus in on the two sides of the tuple, okay? Um, and I use either to combine my action types. So, oh, because I still have the delay here, actually. Uh, let me take that out. Okay, so now you see if I update the code here, uh, you know, in real time, I, I get to try out these different component ideas, which is quite nice. Uh, and then lesson five finally puts, uh, it adds the, the list for all combinators, for each combinator rather, um, so I can create a list of counters. Um, again, I've got that delay, which I should, probably should take out. I think this has been confusing people more than uh, it's been helping. Um, so I can add counters and, and, you know, each one of these evolves independently, but it's modeled by a list of states. Okay. Um, so this is, this is quite nice. You can save code in a gist uh, and share it and, uh, and you can see the JavaScript that it generates and all this nice stuff. So uh, this is quite useful if you want to learn how to use Thermite uh, for components. Um, so that's about it. I think uh, I just had a question slide. So. That's all I have. Yeah.